Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. So as promised, this video is going to be a Q&A all about being on YouTube for 10 years and we're going to talk about the highs, the lows, the career stuff, burnout, mental health, lessons learned, all of that good stuff. Um, but first, you may have noticed that I'm standing up. Yes, it actually like feels kind of weird. <laughs> I'm not used to it in this um, setup, but over the years of me doing YouTube, 10 years, I have sat down, I've sat up to film videos. I think it's just depended on like where I've been filming and the setup that I had in that home and like what fit. And so when we moved in here, I like had this chair in the corner and it was like, okay, great. This is my filming corner. I'll sit here and film videos. And like in the place that I was in previously in that flat, I was standing up for all the videos. And so, yeah, I don't know. I just thought I would try standing again. <laughs> you get some boogie time. 10 years on and I'm still not immune to creating embarrassing content for myself to look back on. So I pulled a bunch of questions from the comments on the Spag Bowl video. And then I also asked on my Instagram stories for some questions that you had and I compiled it to 15. I tried to make it 10, but there's just so many good questions. And I love getting introspective about all of this like career stuff, social media, the internet. Um, so let's dive in. What's one thing you wish your 19 year old self had known about YouTube slash the job that you have now? The truth of it is, is that I'm completely happy with the information that 19 year old me had at the time and the decisions that she made based on that information. I almost feel like if she had more information, if there was a piece of what I know now that I could give to her, I think her having that information might make her make a different decision and not start making YouTube videos. So no, I don't wanna risk it. She was working with what she had and she made it work and she had a great time. She wasn't overthinking it in the same way that I do now. 19 year old me, didn't really overthink a lot of things. The good and bad. How do you feel YouTube has changed over the 10 years and what period of YouTube did I like the most? Oh, okay. So if you've been around on this platform for a while, you will have a general sense of how this platform has changed and not just like technically, but the culture on the site has certainly changed. It's definitely gotten more corporate and more popular. When I first started, which was still like, years after YouTube started, I started making videos in 2011, it was this like, or at least the corner that I found myself in was like nerdfight area. So it was like weirdos, misfits. It was cool within that community, but in the outside world, not cool. And now it depends who you talk to, whether or not YouTube is cool or not. But for the most part, YouTube has gotten cooler. I don't think I have. <laughs> and in terms of what period I liked the most, it's so hard to pick because I kind of love all of them for like what they were. Like the kind of YouTube life that I had in like 2011, 2012 was like staying up late every night and having these like massive video calls of like YouTube friends from like all over the world and it was just like massive group calls full of people who had like a hundred subscribers and we were basically all each other's subscribers and that was so much fun but would I do that now in my position where I am now no I do not have the time or the energy I was so immersed in it I mean I am immersed in it now but in like a very different way in a more structured way <laughs> back then it was pretty chaotic but it is what suited 19 year old me and the platform's just gotten bigger and bigger in the first like few years of me making videos it felt really manageable to like stay on top of what was going on on the platform and like who was big and who was popular because it felt like there was one YouTube community and now obviously there's like thousands of YouTube communities and I can only really know what's going on in like maybe one or two of them like my own and like one other that I'm like lurking in. Where did you picture yourself 10 years later at the time? So when I first started making videos I was on my gap year I was about to start university I was doing a history degree and so what did I think my future held? I knew that when people said to me like oh you're doing a history degree so you're gonna be a history teacher I knew that that was not the case and I was like how dare you you can do loads of things with a history degree like become a YouTuber. So not a history teacher. Although actually I wouldn't mind that now. <laughs> I 
can't remember if this interest started whilst I was doing YouTube and when I was at uni, but I was interested in like getting into TV production and like the behind the scenes kind of stuff because hey, I basically produce two YouTube channels. I am a producer. Um, I'm very organized, like my skills. <laughs> um, but I didn't know that at the time, obviously, but that was something that I was just like, oh, that could be cool. I thought I might be living in New York. Other than that, I've never really had a career plan. I never had a dream job. I was always just like, I'll just <laughs> go to uni, I guess, because that's what you're supposed to do. And I really enjoy history and that's what I want to study. Do I have any idea what I want to do after it? No, we'll figure that out whilst we're at uni. And I did. <laughs> oh, that leads us nicely onto the next question, which is when did you know this is your dream job? I don't know if I ever like clarified it in my head as, oh my God, that's now my dream job. But it was like, oh, I actually want to give this a go and I want to see if I can make this work. And that was in like my second year of uni, I think. That was when I started to earn a little pocket money from YouTube and I was making like monthly trips to London for different events, um, work stuff and like social occasions, like meeting other people from the community. And I definitely had this like impatience of like, oh, I just want to graduate so I can like be in London all the time and like do YouTube stuff. Um, so yeah, second year of uni was when I was like, oh, this could be a thing. If you think I shrunk, I just took my slippers off because I was getting nervous about cutting my head off. Looking forward, do you think there's anything your 39 year old self will look back on 29 year old Hannah and wish you'd worried about less slash spent more time on slash generally understood sooner? Wow. Okay, so for this question, I kind of need to make some assumptions about what 39 year old Hannah's life and values are. The skeptic, in me, or maybe this is quite telling that this is the first thing that comes to mind, is that I kind of predict, <clears throat> maybe, that 39 year old Hannah will wish that 29 year old Hannah figured out making less videos sooner, or like figured out a healthier relationship with YouTube sooner. I don't know how to explain it, but I feel like it comes up in every single video that I make about YouTube, about my career, but it's like this YouTube hamster wheel. And the more I try and fight it and the more I try and like figure it out. And then even when I get into a really good place with it, I'm just like, oh yeah, like I feel really good. Like I'm making weekly content and like, I'm not stressing about it and it's performing really well. And like, even when I'm in like that good, like part of the hamster wheel, I still, I, oh, I don't even know how to explain it. I then think like, oh, the only way out of this, because inevitably there's going to be a bad cycle where it's stressful and I feel like shit and like videos perform badly and it impacts my self-worth and like bleh, 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 and then also just like the burnout cycle of like having to constantly produce. Woo! We're getting there. <laughs> Every so often there'll be this voice in my head that says, Hannah, the only way to win is just to quit. And part of me worries that 39 year old Hannah will be like, oh, I wish 29 year old Hannah had figured that out sooner. Because every time I like have that idea, I'm like, oh, but I'm not ready to quit. Like I'm still like having a good time. Like when the cycle is good, it's good. And there are so many other parts of my job that I really love. I love making the podcast. I love my Patreon. Like I love like working on projects and like seeing something from like beginning to end. Like it's so fun. I love sex education. I love like having this platform and being able to like communicate these ideas about sex that I learn about and like make it accessible to people. And it's really hard to abandon that, really hard. Oh my God, I'm getting off topic because there's other questions about quitting YouTube lol. Um, okay, I think 39 year old Hannah will like regret that 29 year old Hannah spends so much time worrying about this instead of like actively doing something about it and like trying to actually <laughs> rework the structure of my business or like rework the structure of like how I make content in order for this not to stress me out like every month or all the time. All of these things aren't a reflection on a 39 year old Hannah, they're 100% a reflection on my current mental state because it's all like my worries projecting onto like future me. I worry that 39 year old Hannah will wish that I'd spent more time on skill development like video editing, like design, just generally like reading more, maybe even like figuring out doing like in-person sex ed sooner, whether that's with like adults doing workshops or um, figuring out 
working in schools. I don't know, because these are all things that like I want, but like fear and time constraints are holding me back. And so I'm like, is that something that me in the future will be like, why didn't you do that sooner? How do I feel about my future children watching my videos? I have thought about this a lot, but then the conclusion that I always come to is I don't think they will. My main worry is that their friends watch them and then, then their friends like bully them. They wouldn't be their friends if they were bullying them. Um, but people might pick on my kid because like, oh, look what your mum has been doing on the internet, like one, 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 right? But I have a hunch that like my own children wouldn't really take much of an interest in it and wouldn't actively seek out watching their mum's content on YouTube. Maybe I'm naive, <laughs> I don't know. Here we go, maybe I already answered this. Have you ever wanted to quit or experienced burnout? Um, okay, burnout, I think now is its own phenomenon and has like a proper definition, which I don't know off the top of my head and I'm not gonna find for you right now, but Google it. So I don't wanna use that word lightly because I think burnout is like a real serious thing. Like it's a mental health phenomenon. And so I don't think I've experienced that or maybe I'm minimizing my own experience. Who knows? But have I ever wanted to quit? Yes, but not in like a serious way, in a thought experiment way and guess what? This is maybe the most Hannah thing ever. Uh, I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> I have a document where for the past year and a half, maybe, because that's kind of like when it's really been gearing up, maybe year and a half, two years. I don't know. I've been keeping track of every time I have a really low moment and it's my taking a serious break document. So even my mentality of like creating this thing isn't about quitting. It's about like taking a sabbatical essentially is what I'm viewing it as. And what I do is I put in the date, I put in how I'm feeling, I put in what triggered that feeling. Like what was it that made me feel like shit? Like was it a video performing badly? Was it the fact that I spent like six hours on Instagram that day and I was comparing myself and blah, blah, blah. And then there's like an action column. Like what did I do? For now, most of the actions that I take based on these feelings is talking it out with Dan, talking it out with like other YouTube friends, talking with my manager or like scheduling some time off. Like it's not like huge things that I'm doing. And I don't know what the purpose of this spreadsheet is. I'm just kind of like keeping track. And actually over the last like six months or so, I've maybe only put in like one entry into it. So for now we're just tracking and we're seeing if there's any patterns in terms of like what makes me feel like shit and when there's nothing, when I'm just like everything's great, I don't want to need to take a break, like woohoo, sabbatical who. So yeah, now you know about my spreadsheet. But the burnout thing, I was watching a presentation like a year ago or something that kind of spoke a bit about burnout and I can't remember the name of the person and I can't remember where this thing is from, but like somebody came up with this thing um, where like, think of it as like a quadrant, a quadrant, I don't know. There's four parts, right? I'm gonna try and do this for you so you can see. So on what I think is the x-axis, cause it's been years since I did maths, um, you've got positive to negative energy. And then on your y-axis, you've got high to low energy. So in your positive and high energy, this is what is called performance. And this is where we all want to be. We all want to be at high energy and positive energy. We wanna be there, it's like good for our work and our mind and we're like, oh my God, I'm succeeding. Like how good is this? I'm performing at my best, hooray. Then in positive energy but low energy, you've got rest. Rest, rehabilitation, relaxing, uh, taking time off, like it's positive, right? And we also have to like frame that as positive, right? Um, but it's low energy, calm yourself down, it's chill, right? Over here in low energy and negative energy, this is where burnout is. You've got low energy, but it's also negative. It's like bad, I don't have the words to describe it right now, but it's shitty, right? And then up here, in negative energy and high energy is survival. And this is the like <laughs> treading water, like you're about to drown kind of thing. And most of us are functioning here, right? We're striving to get into performance, 
but most of us are here, right? Has this turned into a lecture? But this honestly, like, it really helped me when I learned about this, so I'm just gonna share it with you now. This is gonna be a long video. But basically, it's a complete myth that you can be at performance all of the time. Like, doesn't exist, doesn't work, you cannot be in this quadrant constantly. You cannot jump from survival to performance. You cannot get from here to here without going through here first. The way that she explained it was that the only way to performance is through rest. You cannot make this jump. And so obviously like if you're in burnout as well, you also have to go through rest in order to get to performance. So there you go. That really helped me. I hope I explained that well. So I don't think I've experienced burnout, but I do think that most of the time I'm in survival and at risk of burnout because that basically is what happens. If you spend too much time in survival, then you are gonna crash eventually. But I think one thing that has meant that I've avoided burnout, being here, is because I do rest and I do take that very seriously. So I'm definitely in survival a lot of the time, but I also think that that's like fine as long as you're not spending all of your time there and you do, you know, I'm just like dotting between these three. <laughs> What's your favorite thing about your life that's changed because? Of YouTube. It's hard to like say what is because of YouTube and then also just like aging in the last 10 years because the last 10 years of my life like I've been making YouTube videos <laughs> so it's all because of YouTube so I have a wonderful husband because of YouTube because I met him through his sister who was a friend that I met through YouTube. I um, live in this wonderful flat that I own because of YouTube and that's because of money that I've earned from YouTube. I've been able to go on like amazing trips because of YouTube. I don't know, like <laughs> what has changed? <laughs> what, what has changed about my actual life? Friends that I have, where I live, London? Yeah, like being a Londoner now. I don't know if I would have made it here if it wasn't for YouTube. I don't know if I ever like considered even living in London. I guess one of my other favorite things that have changed about my life is just like the skills that I've acquired from doing this for 10 years. Like so many different skills, jack of all trades. What boundaries slash personal policies did being on YouTube teach you? <gasps> so many, so many. It taught me about the difference between privacy and secrecy. It taught me about other people and how what I'm seeing of them online is not the full picture and I don't deserve to see the full picture. And that is not something that me as a viewer of their content or a follower of them, that is not something that I am entitled to. And so I think being on YouTube and experiencing it as the creator and <laughs> I am the creator. Uh, <laughs> um, experiencing it from this position and having to set boundaries also helps me as a consumer of content in terms of how I interact with other people online. Your relationship with the term YouTuber, influencer, content creator over the years. Yeah, this is a good one because also I looked it up recently and the uh, term influencer didn't actually catch on in how it is used now until like 2015. So for the first four years of me making content, there's no such thing as an influencer. Like I wasn't an influencer, but 2015 was when all of the brands caught on and all of the marketing companies were like, these people are influential. We can make some money out of them. <laughs> so influencer, my relationship with that word since it came into being um, has kind of stayed the same, which it makes me uncomfortable if I'm only described as that because it's only describing my monetizable marketing function. It's not actually describing what I do, but it's a good term just for shorthand communication with people when I'm just like, yeah, I'm an influencer. Um, and people understand what you mean. YouTuber, oh my God, I've gone through so many iterations of my feelings towards this word. Definitely at the beginning, was happy to use it and then went through a like, I'm not a YouTuber <laughs> um, phase. One of the reasons being was because I heard somebody say, and I can't remember who this was, but if we use titles that are tied to a platform, what happens if that platform disappears? So will I still be a YouTuber if YouTube goes? No, I won't. I'd be a video maker, a video content creator, a vlogger. Like, would I be an Instagrammer if Instagram disappears? No, I wouldn't. But I would be, oh my God, I would be an influencer. <laughs> What's the word? Uh, 
I'm not a photographer, a model. <laughs> a blogger like yeah Instagram is a micro blog there we go blogger I like to try and use terms that aren't tied to a platform um, but I don't mind youtuber because I do feel like that a lot of what I do is so like part of YouTube as a platform culturally so I don't mind it content creator is kind of what I use because also I create lots of kinds of content right um, podcaster I like to use um, because podcaster is also not tied to a specific platform I'm an Apple podcaster I'm a Spotifyer I'm a writer I'm a sex educator that one I like to go with because like sex educator is what I do and then like content creator podcaster youtuber that's the medium in which I do it advice for people who are starting YouTube now go into it with an intention of like what you want it to be is it a fun hobby treat it like it make sure you're having a good time if your intention is for it to be fun and you find yourself stressing about it like kind of go hold on for one second this is supposed to be fun but if you are going into it with the intention of like maybe you have a, a business that you want to promote through your youtube videos or you want to share an experience and connect with the community take it seriously in whatever capacity it is that you want to be doing YouTube. So if it's a hobby and it's meant to be fun, take that seriously, like only fun here. Um, but if you want to use it professionally, then take it seriously as a professional, even if nobody is watching, like do the work. And then also I think manage your expectations because like you could be uploading hundreds and hundreds of videos and not really seeing the rewards that you might want and so making your goals about what you do like oh i want to make a hundred videos great and if you achieve that that is a success rather than like i want to hit 100 subscribers because then if you don't achieve that you're going to feel like shit, right um so pick goals that are in your control and use youtube for tutorials on how to edit and film <laughs> has being on social media for so long affected your mental health short answer Yes. Long answer, I don't think social media is inherently bad at impacting people's mental health. It's all about how we use it. Actually, no, that's a lie. I watch The Social Dilemma. I think it's built into these platforms to fuck us up. Wow, we really turned there. It's hard to say because how much research really is out there, like long studies where they look at a group of people over 10 years and go, how has exposure and usage of social media impacted your mental health over this like really long period of time? Do those studies exist? I wanna read them. No, I wanna read summaries of them. <laughs> like there's no doubt it's impacted my mental health, but like in what way? I don't know. I think there's definitely something to be said for like performing your life to strangers for 10 years. And like, where is the line between like oh, this cool thing happened in my life and I want to share it versus like your life being available for people to consume rather than your life just being your life and something that you experience. How did your experience at YouTube conventions change throughout the years? I love this question because I think about this a lot and I find it really funny because I think this is a really interesting indicator of it going from being uh, a hobby to it being like my career. So at the beginning, I would have given an arm and a leg to get to VidCon, right? I would have done anything to get into those exclusive parties the FOMO was real it was like such desperation like it was uh, 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 painful and then you get to me now and in the last few years where I'm like if you're not going to pay for my hotel or travel like I don't care I'm not coming that is the difference like obviously it was like a gradual change but I'm just like are you gonna let me speak on some panels and are you paying for my expenses cool I'll see you there if not Peace. I don't feel that FOMO anymore. I'm just like, you know what? I've been to enough conventions now. And it's so interesting because I think of like, oh my God, 19 year old Hannah would be like freaking out. Like what? You just said no. <laughs> like, why would you go to this convention? <laughs> and then one of the other things of my difference in experiences is those first few conventions that I went to chaotic. I was, I was a chaotic neutral at those events. And now I'm a lawful good. But by 
being a chaotic neutral, I mean, I was wasted or hungover for basically about four days straight. There was a lot of hooking up. There was also like sharing a room with like five other people because you couldn't afford to go any other way. Staying up stupidly late, losing my voice. And then now it's like, I have to have my own hotel room because I know how overwhelming these conventions can be and they can be really emotionally and physically draining for me. So I'm like, okay, I need my own space to come back to. You know, I'll have a few drinks, but I won't get like ridiculously drunk and I'll like be in bed by midnight. And then I'll be up the next morning to do like a 9 a.m. panel because it's work. It was a crazy party for me. And then now it's like work and then I get to have a few drinks with friends. So yeah, that's the difference. It's kind of interesting. If I wasn't doing this, what would I be doing as a job slash career? I honestly don't know. Like maybe I would have still found my passion in sex education and maybe I would be doing that, but more like on the ground and in person in schools or in youth clubs or with adults, like, I don't know, like maybe I'd be doing that. Maybe I'd be working in TV or maybe I would just be somebody working in an office as a project manager. One of my patrons recently said I would make a great project manager and I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, final question. Oh my God, we made it. Do you think you'll still be on YouTube in 10 years time? The question that we're all asking. I honestly do not know. When I think about how much has changed over the last 10 years, I imagine or I hope that there'll be a similar amount of change in the next 10 years. I don't know what that's gonna be, but if I'm still doing what I'm currently doing right now in 10 years time, then I'll be like, hmm, I've kind of stagnated, haven't I? Like, why am I still <laughs> doing this? And that doesn't mean like quitting YouTube, but it's more like, how I'm doing it. You know what I mean? I look at the Vlogbrothers and I'm like, oh, they're in their 40s making YouTube content and they're incredible and they have like this amazing community. But other than them, I personally don't have that many like older role models on YouTube to kind of be like, how <laughs> would this work in 10 years time for me? Who knows? I can't imagine that I would like stop completely uploading videos, but just like, how I use the platform and what kind of videos that I'd be uploading and like how it fits into broader like my business and like what I'm doing. I feel like that probably would change. Who knows? Do you have any predictions? Help me out. Can you all be my like career coaches in the comments? Thanks. <laughs> any career coaches in my audience? <laughs> Fucking hell. Wow. What is this video turned into? Therapy for Hannah. Whew. Actually, I was having a conversation with some other like sex educators recently and we were saying how a lot of things are therapeutic, but only therapy is therapy. So this has been therapeutic for me. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for a wild 10 years um, growing up on YouTube. Like, thank you for giving me this space to do this. Thank you for welcoming me into your life. You know, that's what it is when you watch someone's content, like you're inviting me in and like, that is huge. That is massive. Like there's not that many people that I let into my life in terms of who I watch on YouTube. So yeah, I really appreciate your time that you spend with me here. I appreciate all of your comments and your pleasant interactions. It feels a bit weird to be like, hope you like this video. Please like it, comment below. But in all seriousness, I feel like I just tried shit for a long time. And so if you do have any thoughts and wanna carry on these discussions, cause these are things I think about all of the time, then we can do that in the comments. If you're a patron, we can like really get into it in the Discord server, we can like go hard. That's another thing that has changed. I forgot to pull out a question about this, but one thing I've been thinking a lot recently that has changed is I used to just kind of like use social media and YouTube to just kind of like throw stuff out into the void and see what stuck. Especially Twitter, it'd be like, oh, I like this thing, I hate this thing, and da -da 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 -da. and it would be where I went to try and like find community and like, I want somebody to talk with me about this thing. And now I definitely like care way less about having those interactions on Twitter or on Instagram. And I'll go to my Patreon Discord server because, you know, I don't know. I feel like I just got to this place where I was just like, I don't care what all of these strangers on the internet think. I want a more like quality response. You guys are quality. But also it's like, it's more manageable. Like it's actually having a community rather than just like putting something 
out there and being like, I wonder who will see this and respond. It's just like, no, it's actually like a massive group chat with people that you actually like. <laughs> Does that sound really ridiculous? Anyway, I'm gonna actually go now. Bye, thank you. Dive in. Oh my God. Also, if it looks like I've got a mono boob, it's because I don't wear bras anymore. I'm just like constantly in bralettes and these comfort um, tops. So it just makes it look like I just have one blob of a boob. They're not distinct creatures anymore. We're all one. Okay. Oh, my hands are so crusty. Maybe if I take my slippers off, I'll lose an inch and I'll get shorter. There we go. Yeah. So this question, I have to make some assumptions about 13 year old, 13 year olds? Did I say the question correctly? Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. 